Welcome to the series of video lectures on designing crop polycultures supported by the International Visegrad Fund. The topic of this lecture is agroforestry with a focus on temperate regions. My name is Sonia Brodes and I am Deputy Director of the University of California Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. This lecture will cover five areas. I will start with the definition and general description of agroforestry, followed by detailed descriptions of distinguishing features of agroforestry systems, especially focusing on how woody perennial species specifically can affect or change a polyculture system. I will then describe a number of examples of different types of agroforestry systems used in temperate regions with descriptions of ecosystem and socioeconomic benefits of each. Next, I will demonstrate some analyses one can use to understand how well an agroforestry system is performing. Finally, I will touch briefly on current knowledge gaps and research needs. Agroforestry is generally defined as any land use system that deliberately integrates woody perennial trees, shrubs, or vines with other crops and or livestock in an integrated production system. This integration of perennial components can be either in the same space and time, or it can be in the same space but occupying it at different times or the components may be in different places but interacting in time. In a minute, I will show examples of each of these. But what's important to remember overall is that the defining feature of agroforestry is that there is some deliberate or planned interaction between the woody perennial components and the other crop or livestock components. Merely having an orchard in one part of the farm and a pasture for livestock on another part of the farm does not make it an agroforestry system unless there is some biophysical interaction between the two. Here are some examples of agroforestry systems that integrate in both space and time. The top photo in southern France shows winter grain crops grown between rows of high value timber trees. In the other photo, you will see poultry pastured under olive trees in central Italy. Here we see a picture of a system in which the components occupy the same space but are staggered in time. This is in Yunnan, China, where they grow pineapples for two to three years while planting timber trees visible in the background that eventually shade out the pineapple and can be harvested after 20 years. The average annual income to the farmers is estimated to be about 10 times the value of what they would get from just growing agricultural crops by themselves without the long-term timber production. This is an example of a system that occupies different spaces, but the interactions between species occur in real time. Farmers, such as this man in Zambia, are planting nitrogen-fixing Fiderbia trees on cropland, while simultaneously growing maize crops underneath the trees. That's an, an example of the first kind of system that I showed, occupying the same space at the same time. However, they can also cut branches of this tree to carry and feed to livestock kept elsewhere. In fact, <clears throat> the trees also produce protein-rich pods, which are nutritious for cattle and other livestock. So this is also an example of a system integrated in time, but occupying different spaces. There are several unique features of agroforestry systems that set them apart from other polycultures. These characteristics have to do with their defining feature which is that they always include a woody perennial component. Compared to systems with only annual and herbaceous crops, the presence of trees, shrubs, or vines gives us two key characteristics. One, a larger architecture or three-dimensional structure, and two, a slower, longer time horizon of growth and development. 
These two broad characteristics lead to some important details that I'm going to talk more about in the next set of slides. In terms of having a larger, more complex architectural structure, trees can play a major role in creating more moderate microclimates for crops growing under or near them. For example, this photo shows an old walnut orchard in the northern central valley of California. The valley has a Mediterranean type climate and gets quite hot and dry during the summer months and is typically not such a good place to grow brassica species and other leafy greens in the summer growing season. Instead, these crops are generally limited to the rainy season from late fall to early spring. However, the farmers who have this orchard find that they can extend their harvest season into the early summer months because they are protected from some of the early summer heat as the walnut trees start to leaf out and provide shade. This gives them an advantage in the local farmer's market because they can sell these leafy greens for some time after other farmers with open fields production have already stopped selling them. Windbreaks are probably one of the better known examples of using trees on the edges of crop fields to moderate weather extremes. Research has shown that windbreaks can reduce wind speed by 15 to 75 percent, and this effect extends for a distance equal to 20 times or more the height of the windbreak. In temperate and more arid climates, windbreaks reduce turbulent mixing of air, resulting in daytime temperatures that are several degrees higher than the surrounding area, within a distance of eight times the height of the windbreak. They can also increase nighttime temperatures by one to two degrees Celsius for a distance up to 30 times the height of the windbreak. Research results are somewhat mixed, with some studies showing enhanced field crop growth with windbreaks and from 6 to 44 percent higher yields. But some studies don't show such effects. A lot depends on the details of windbreak design and regional weather dynamics. The structural complexity that trees bring to a cropping system can provide important wildlife habitat. This has been shown in California's Central Valley where the landscape is dominated by intensive crop production, often with many short stature annual crops. Studies have shown that when field margins have hedgerows, tree lines, or some remnant riparian habitat, they harbor two to three times as many bird species as field margins that are kept bare or covered with a typical mix of weeds. They also have three to six times higher total abundance of birds, and these are not necessarily large flocks of crop-eating birds. They are native songbirds that utilize resources within the hedgerow. They also have significant greater species evenness, which tells us that every species found is well represented by similar numbers of individuals. Larger and more complex above-ground architecture is also mirrored by below-ground architecture, meaning deeper root systems. When you have a polyculture system with diverse crops having a range of rooting depths, such as trees growing near smaller herbaceous crops, your system can utilize water and nutrients from a larger volume of soil. Research has shown, for example, that tree roots and agroforestry systems can scavenge nitrogen and phosphorus from deeper in the soil profile than other crops, preventing leaching of these nutrients out of the root zone. Trees and cropland can thereby also recycle nutrients from deeper layers back up to the soil surface through their leaf litter. Finally, some tree species have been documented to perform hydraulic lift. This means that in arid conditions, they can use their roots to take up water from deeper, moister soil layers and bring it up to drier soil layers, which helps their roots to survive, but can also make more soil moisture available to understory plants. These below ground abilities of trees should be carefully considered in the design of agroforestry systems. Researchers in France found that walnuts 
tree roots grow significantly deeper when the trees are interplanted with wheat compared to being grown without an intercrop, perhaps due to root competition with the wheat in the more shallow soil depths. The researchers think that this factor may help to make these systems overall more resilient to occasional droughts. So by designing a polyculture system like this in a way that encourages deeper root growth, you may be able to improve the long-term performance and resilience of your system. Let's move now to the other key feature of trees that we have ident identified as important, the fact that they have longer lifespans. This means that they also take longer to establish and reach their full stature. Farmers can take advantage of this characteristic by planting other intercrops between orchard trees for the first few years of an orchard's life. This example is again from California, where walnut producers can gain extra income by growing a hay crop between tree rows while the trees are still small and not producing any income yet. You can see the first walnut tree in the row circled in yellow. Tree crops like fruits and nuts often command relatively higher prices on the market, perhaps partly because they do require a higher upfront investment at planting time with no immediate returns for the first few years. In the long run, these higher prices allow for much higher returns per acre or per hectare compared to many annual crops. Let's take a look at this example from a region in California where these two crops processing tomatoes and almonds are both commonly grown, although not in agroforestry systems usually. I took recent farm gate prices from cost and return studies for these two crops, which range from $72.50 per US ton for tomatoes to $5,000 per US ton for almonds. These prices were converted to per acre gross returns using typical crop yields for this region. Operating costs and then other fixed costs were taken into account. However, even so, almonds provide for substantially higher net returns per acre. Tomato producers in some years may not even break even, as you can see with the negative $123. This kind of comparison would hold true for many other tree fruits and nuts compared to many other annual field crops, including grains. Tree crops have the potential to substantially increase the returns from your cropping system. The long lifespans of trees means that they can often act as reserve bank accounts for the farmer especially if used to produce biomass like timber, which is flexible in terms of when it can be harvested. This example is from southern France, where polonia trees on the left are interspersed with other crops. The farmer can wait to harvest a tree when extra income is needed. One of these polonia trees was sold for 1,000 euros to a specialty surfboard maker. Timber trees can also be manipulated quite a bit to minimize negative impacts, such as from shade, on understory crops. In the picture on the right, researchers have partnered with the farmer to run pruning trials, which reduce shading but do not interfere with the main stem, which is the high-value product in timber trees. The long lifespan of woody trees and shrubs also means they can provide the important ecosystem service of carbon sequestration. One study of a tomato field in California found that field edge hedgerows stored 18% of the total carbon on the farm, while they occupied only 6% of the land area. However, the trees need to stay in the ground long enough so that they really keep the carbon in place and it doesn't get sent back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Conventionally, 100 years is considered a typical time frame to be counted as long-term sequestration, but shorter time frames can still help to a more limited extent. 
Now I'm going to return to reviewing some of the many different types of agroforestry systems that exist, especially in temperate climates. This is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but I'll be showing some examples of each of these with some of their known benefits. Field edge plantings. We've already looked at some examples of these, including multiple species native hedgerows. But let me add that research results in California have shown that systems like these can significantly increase populations of natural predators as well as pollinators. I will talk more about that in a later slide. They have also been shown by many studies to be able to filter excess nutrients and other agricultural pollutants from the field runoff, as well as water percolating into the soil. And as I just noted earlier, they can sequester carbon long term. Windbreaks are another type of field edge planting, and I already described the benefits of windbreaks in creating more moderate microclimates for crops in the adjacent fields. Another type of system I would consider as an agroforestry system is cover cropping in orchards, like planting clover in this almond orchard. Cover crops are any plants that are planted just for their ecosystem benefits and not for obtaining a commercial crop. The topic of crop, cover cropping in orchards is treated more thoroughly in another lecture in this series. So here, let me just quickly summarize that cover crops have many beneficial effects on orchards, including soil health improvements, production of nectar and pollen to support crop pollinators, and beneficial insect habitat for predators of crop pests. It is important to find the right species of cover crops that are most compatible with orchard operations. For example, if a crop is picked up from the ground, such as almonds in California, that are first shaken to the ground and then swept up, you will need a cover crop that senesces and breaks down in the soil by harvest time. Careful species selection is very important. Another type of agroforestry system is alley cropping, growing crops in the alleys, which are the spaces between rows of trees in an orchard. One model of this is to grow crops during the first few years of the orchard's lifespan. I already discussed this system earlier. One of the main benefits of this system is that it earns some income for the grower during a time that the trees are not yet bearing a crop. It can also help build the orchard soil with organic matter from the crops. The other model of alley cropping is to grow crops continuously between the tree rows, even when the trees are mature. Here we see peppers and other vegetables growing in a stone fruit orchard. The benefits again are additional income, as well as soil <clears throat> and biodiversity benefits. Challenges might include competition for light, water, and nutrient resources between trees and crops. Some farmers deal with this challenge by using a tillage implement to rip or cut a line in the soil alongside the tree, root, uh, the tree rows to keep their roots from extending into the alley where the crops are growing. Also, it may be necessary to accommodate possibly different irrigation needs and schedules for the vegetable crops and the tree crops. And finally, you need to take care not to damage the alley crop during any tree maintenance or harvest operations. Grazing in orchards and vineyards is another type of system that is gaining popularity in many countries. Here we see geese with a guard dog in a vineyard in central Italy and sheep grazing in a California vineyard. Some studies of sheep grazing in vineyards in California and New Zealand have found multiple ecosystem benefits, some of which translate into direct economic benefits for the grower. Researchers have found that introduction of sheep helps with weed and cover crop control and increases residue recycling. Grazing builds soil health 
by increasing soil carbon and nitrogen deposition, increasing aggregation, and increasing microbial activity and diversity. Compared to soil in vineyards where there are only cover crops with no grazing. The activities of the sheep reduce the amount of mowing and herbicides needed by the vineyard manager, earning savings of US 60 to $80 per acre per season in California. Sheep can also remove lower leaves, saving on manual leaf plucking labor. Grazing can help with fire prevention around the vineyard, and sheep provide new marketing opportunities. These benefits were found in California and also in New Zealand, where they are detailed in a 2018 paper by Niles et al. In these systems, it is important to rotate the sheep very frequently and not leave them in any one vineyard for too long to avoid soil compaction and damage to vines and even irrigation infrastructure. Silvopasture is grazing in forests, either natural forests or plantations. Here we see a natural deciduous forest area in southern France, where sheep are brought to graze on fruits and nuts in the fall when forage is in short supply in other pasture areas. Down below, we see cattle grazing under a plantation of honey locust trees in the southeastern United States. Sheep may also be grazed in these areas, and studies have shown that despite forage production being reduced under the trees compared to open pasture areas, the sheep weight gain is similar, due in large part to improved animal welfare when cool shade is available. In addition, the honey locust trees produce protein-rich pods that sheep can eat. Food forests are very complex, multi-species systems, often with multiple architectural layers, mimicking natural forests. Here is an example from a high elevation site in the Rocky Mountains in the US. There is an overstory of pear and apple trees, a mid-story layer of gooseberries, rhubarb, horseradish, and Siberian pea shrub, and an understory of hollyhock, comfrey, and garlic. And in between, grapevines link between the different layers. These systems really make use of every resource niche for high density production of crops, as well as high rates of recycling of materials. Due to their structural complexity, they tend to rely on hand labor and are not suited to being managed by the large equipment of industrialized agriculture. Therefore, in temperate regions, they are more often seen in the context of home gardens or community gardens. More mechanized systems can, however, also be more complex to an extent. Here is an example of a recently planted system in California, planted in rows accessible by tractor. It will eventually consist of an overstory of chestnut trees, which are the saplings currently seen in the central rows. Smaller stone fruit trees will be located in outer rows for a shorter term mid-story that will eventually be taken out once the chestnuts mature, while herbs such as lavender occupy a few rows in the understory. In addition, sheep will graze in the adjoining strips of pasture that are located between these strips of multi-story crops. Benefits may include that the herbs can provide pollinator and other beneficial insect support for the tree crops. The trees, once tall enough, will provide shade for sheep in the adjoining strips, and the sheep provide nutrient and soil health benefits, as well as income diversification. Let's turn now to considering how we can measure the success of agroforestry systems, especially in an economic sense. One way is to compare the productivity of agroforestry systems with the productivity of soil cropping systems. We can make this comparison using the land equivalent ratio, which is the ratio between the relative yield of each tree and crop species in a polyculture compared to the yield of the same species in monoculture. The LER is an expression of the added value or the added production 
you get from combining two crops in one field compared to if you grew either crop separately on the same amount of land. So let's look at this simple example. If you had a two crop system consisting of apples and wheat, say in an alley cropping system, then you would first consider how much yield you would expect to get from a one hectare field of only wheat. Let's say six tons. You could also expect to get 40 tons of apples from a one hectare apple orchard. Now let's look at one hectare of the alley cropping system. The wheat is grown on less land because some of the area is taken up by apple trees. In addition, yields may be a little reduced due to some shading from the trees. So perhaps you would only get 50% of the yield or three tons. For the apples, the yield may also be slightly reduced due to wider row spacing and some competition. So let's say you get only 80% of the one hectare yield or 32 tons. You then calculate the LER by adding the two fractions, 50% or three tons over six tons plus 80% or 32 tons over 40 tons. The result is 130% or 1.3. Any LER value that is greater than one means that you have a net yield benefit with the polyculture compared to the monocrops. So the two crops combined together are getting you more than if they were grown separately on the same area of land. Keep in mind that if you have two crops that earn very different per hectare revenues because they have very different prices, it might be better to calculate the LER in financial terms, such as in dollars of revenue, instead of using crop yields. In some cases, you can relatively easily increase the LER if you can find a way to integrate productive trees where before there were none with no detrimental impact to the other crop. For example, in this photo, we see young elderberry plants growing in a hedgerow along a crop field's edge, which was previously used as a road. Our studies in California have shown that even in two years time, with the elderberry plants not mature yet, you can potentially earn revenue totaling 2,883 US dollars above costs from a 300 meter hedgerow by harvesting the berries. Many products can be made on farm from these elderberries. The revenues can significantly increase as the elderberries mature beyond two years. Besides just looking at increased yields or revenue, another way to look at success of agroforestry systems is to consider whether they help to reduce the need for external inputs, thereby providing cost savings. Keep in mind that a well-designed system should ideally be able to provide for some of its own ecological functioning, reducing the need for external inputs. In another example, using field edge hedgerows, Researchers in California have found that multi-species hedgerows can provide nectar and pollen resources and habitat to support natural enemies of crop pests, such as aphids. These natural enemies travel into the crop field quite a good distance from the hedgerow, at least 200 meters or more. In a trial, they found that only one in eight tomato fields next to hedgerows required any pesticides for aphid control while four out of eight fields without hedgerows required treatment. They estimated the cost savings from avoided pesticide applications to be around $260 per 16 hectare field. They also found that canola plants had a 36% increase in pollination in fields with hedgerows due to increased populations of native bees and other native pollinators. They estimated this would increase crop production and increase revenue by $2,416 per 16 hectare field. So while researchers around the world are starting to pay more attention to polyculture systems such as agroforestry, there is still much to be learned. We really need more research both above and below ground, such as with soil pits in the left photo, 
to identify, quantify, and place economic value on ecosystem services that occur in these systems. We also need to learn more about designing the best combinations of crop species so that they can take full advantage of the unique capabilities of trees while also benefiting the other crops in the system. Finally, we need to learn more about how to proactively manage complexity. The greater complexity of these systems is one of the most common challenges that farmers mention who have agroforestry systems. We need new practices, including equipment that fits better in multi-species systems. And we also need to consider new business arrangements. For example, two different farm operators working together on the same piece of land to manage different components of the agroforestry system. Here, I present you with the list of references cited in this presentation. For further information and for other video lectures in this series, please go to YouTube and find the lectures on designing crop polycultures for academic courses and also video lectures for extension training for farmers. For more information on ongoing research and education work in this area of permaculture and polycultures, please visit the website listed. And for more information about agroforestry and hedgerow related work in California, please visit the website of my program, the University of California Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. Thank you for your attention.